Blue Blood Heat Check is kind of what we're calling it. And I like this one. Let's start with the Texas Longhorns. Um, Tom, we'll tee you up first just in terms of where they're standing with some of these guys recruiting-wise. And then, Drew, you and I will get a little bit into the scouting side. But past three finishes for the Longhorns and Steve Sarkeesian, sixth last year in 2024, third in 2023, fifth in 2022. I mean, I don't know if I had that expectation for Steve Sarkeesian when they hired him, but uh, he has been able to back it up on the recruiting trail. The guys that we are looking at entertaining for the Longhorns and you know, I think would be the cherry on top uh, for this currently ranked number 17 class. DeCorian Moore, Michael Fasusi, Riley Pettijohn, Jonah Williams, a big one there, the five-star, and Dorian Brew. A lot of big names uh, on the board for Texas. Tom, how are they looking right now? Yeah, I collaborated a little bit with Hank South and Jordan Scruggs over at Horns 24-7 and kind of put together a, a dream list of guys that they feel like they could actually land and there's no bigger target than five-star wide receiver DeCorian Moore. He's committed to LSU, but keeping an eye on Texas, Ohio State, other and Oregon, they're all battling. Um, you know, I could see Oregon losing Dallas Wilson, like I already mentioned. So it'll be interesting if they turn up the heat even more for DeCorian Moore. Um, that's an intriguing option, Ohio State as well. But Texas has long been considered the likeliest of landing spots if LSU doesn't work out. Michael Fasusi, once we kind of wrap this up here, I'm going to toss in a crystal ball for, for Texas. I'm going to join Jan, uh, Hank South on that one. Feel like the Longhorns in a really good spot. It's going to visit on June 21st. And uh, I like the fact that they'll get the, as of today, the last crack at him. Oklahoma, AM, Missouri also very much in play. But I was at Battle Houston over the weekend, and everybody just kind of said Fasusi to Texas is, is where things are trending. Uh, Riley Pettijohn, top 100 linebacker from Texas. Longhorns are battling USC, Florida State, a couple others. Those three will get official visits in June. Big priority for the Longhorns. They want to get that one done. You guys love Jonah Williams. We talk about him all the time. Five-star safety. Will they land at Texas, Oklahoma, A&M, Oregon? Uh, will he go to another th uh, team like Ohio State? Will he pick baseball? We obviously know how good of a talent he is there. He could be a very high draft pick. So landing him won't be easy for the Longhorns, but they're definitely in play. Uh, Dorian Brew from Texas, top 100 cornerback. Ohio State was the team to beat. He was in Ohio. Then he went back to Texas. Um, Texas is battling LSU and USC and Oregon. I'm kind of leaning towards the Trojans at this point, but Texas is going to get him back on campus. They are very much in play. So that would be a big pickup for the Longhorns and Steve Sarkeesian. But there's a lot of top targets on the board. They need to land some of these guys. Drew, let's start with the crystal ball there. Uh, Michael Fasusi, number six offensive tackle in the country, number 38 overall. We got to see him. Um, at the future 50 last year uh, in Tampa, and certainly a guy that we like a lot. Uh, is it Tampa? I mean, what, what, Tampa's what, an hour away from Bradenton, Florida? Then we got Drew's frozen. So, Tom, you and I might have to carry the show right now. But um, Fasusi, certainly a guy that we like a lot. You think about him, his size, 35-plus inch arms would be a great fit. Kyle Flood, I don't know. Uh, just feels like they got to get it going in that offensive line group. They had a, they had a couple cycles ago. This felt like a team and a program that had it rolling, and they do, uh, especially on that offensive line. Drew, I think we got you back. You got us? Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to still be here, but I'm here. Florida man, Florida man Wi-Fi stuff going on down there, but that's all right. We got to figure it out. We're talking Michael Fasusi, offensive line, Texas. I was just commenting. I don't know. I feel like it's been a while since they had that guy on the offensive line, and although he's raw, I kind of I, I love this dude's upside, and I, I kind of see him potentially being a fixture there if Texas can get it over the finish line. I'm in the same boat as you, right? Just in the college football playoff, I think it is a loaded year in the Lone Star State for this tackle position. I know Gabe Brooks is going to write a story on it here soon because I told him he needs to. You have Ty Haywood, Michael Fasusi, Lamont Rogers. You got to get one of these guys, and Fasusi is the one that that fires me up the most. I, I think. Everything you said, he's he's a, a work in progress, but I think the ceiling is through the roof. I've I've tried to keep pushing him up the rankings, and um, you know, right now he's in the top forty. We'll see where he ends up, but I think that's the guy to me that you know I want to see if Texas can get the job done. Um, great part about the chat is that we can attend to certain things as they come up. Even though producer Sanle has warned me not to do this, but Patrick Page says. Are you guys going to ding the players for choosing Texas and drop a star in the next eight months? That's a real question. LOL. LOL. In return, Patrick, what I would say is Texas has finished sixth, third, and fifth. 
you know, some really good bias there. Anyway, we'll carry on. Texas A&M, number 28, past three finishes, 19th, 15th, and 1st in 2022. Uh, the guys that come up to the top of the board here, Noah McHale, uh, top 247 linebacker for us, Kalik Lockett, guy that we love, Hussan Longstreet, uh, obviously a name that is a household name here for the Oyster Boys and DJ Sanders. So, um, Tom, I want to start with Kalik Lockett. Uh, this is a guy that is one of the most explosive dynamic playmakers in the country. I think we talked a lot about DeCorey and Moore. I think everybody's trying to figure out what does this receiver class look like uh, compared to classes uh, before uh, in the 2024 class, which had seven or eight receivers in the top 32. Kalik Lockett's like one of those guys that I think could uh, very well uh, hold his ground in that conversation. What's the latest you're hearing with him? A&M is very much in play there. USC, Penn State, Florida State, Ohio State, LSU, very much in play as well. But official visits are locked in with Texas and USC. That's kind of the latest. And he's going to be on campus at A&M on April 20th. But likes the Aggies a lot. I know I mentioned it. He grew up around the program. Grandmother worked there. Uh, the school means a lot to him. It's, it means something different, a little special to him. So, And he's got a great relationship with Coach Wiggins. So I definitely think A&M can get that one done, but it's, I mean, as Mike Roach, better than anybody could tell you, that he is wide open. There are a lot of schools in play, and he's an elite talent. So he's going to uh, have a lot of guys coming after him, and it's going to get interesting throughout his process. Any, um, uh, yeah, go ahead, Drew. <laughs> I don't know if he's on the run. I mean, what do you think the, the Aggies are going to do here at quarterback? I think Kassan Longstreet is probably the best bet at this point. Got the commitment date set for April 14th. He is going to be on campus in two days. Um, Auburn made it interesting, man. They they uh, had kind of an eye-opening, potentially game-changing visit with him recently. But in the end, I'm, I'm very close to putting in a crystal ball pick. But Auburn's been always the one that's kind of made me nervous and a little hesitant about putting a pick in for the Aggies. So we'll see how it goes in two days. But the quicker they can get that done, I know Mike Elko would be smiling if they can land the elite talent from California. What's the what's the draw there for Longstreet that is seemingly give given A and M the edge? That's kind of what I'm fascinated by because he seems, I mean, he's got no shortage of options, right? So the A and M one to me from a guy from Southern California, I'm just trying to figure that out. Have they just done a, a better job in terms of building the relationship? What is what's what's the draw for Longstreet? Well, first time we spoke, it was it was all about A and M, and it kind of caught me off guard because I expected him to say other things like the Oregon's and the USC's and UCLA and things like that. But it was all about A and M right away. Auburn's made it close, but from day one of connecting with him and, and really talking to him about the schools that were very much in play for him. He just kept raving about AM. So I honestly could have put that pick in a month or so ago, but I just knew he was going to take some time, take some visits. And um, I like that he wants to shut it down sooner rather than later. He wants to recruit really hard for the school he chooses. And right now, my best guess would be that it's AM. I left this name off, uh, but Drew, I think you're on to something with Keoti Armstrong. Uh, number three tight end, number 65 player. You got to watch him this morning. Whoa. I like him <laughs> a lot. Um, Tom, where does, where does, where do the Aggies stand with uh, Keoti Armstrong? I think that he's kind of still all over the place. I don't think that he's really close to making a final decision, but but AM's right there uh, at the top of the list uh, with a few others. He's got the official visit lined up for June 13th. Um, I know we talked about it with with Longstream, but Auburn Auburn is very much a player in that one. They're going to get him first, and then and then Texas will get him after that. But I could I could see the Aggies getting this one done. He's a top priority, but that's probably I guess I'd probably say that's a three team race right now. But he just didn't seem too quick to want to make a decision. But I'm watching A and M, Texas, and Auburn right now for Armstrong. Drew, let me tee you up. Um, I like teeing you up on guys that I know you like, so I'll let you take the floor here on Coyote Armstrong. Well, I think I was going to ask you this: Do you think he's where? Where would you play Coyote Armstrong? We list him as a tight end. We've talked about listing him as an athlete some people including myself that could see him as a defensive lineman where, where, where do you see him on Saturdays I think guys like that especially if they they want to be noted on the offensive side of the football then that's that's what you got to do I mean the other thing about him is you know what I like about him obviously the length uh, you talk about the basketball baseball background I think he's a three sporter as well I mean he's physical at the point of the attack he's not one of those guys you just flex out right like he is a really willing dude uh that's still got a lot of weight to put on in the frame as well I thought attacks the football he's not timid um you know i think the comp that has come up and we don't throw it around lightly but the name that i think you used was darnell washington he's further along than darnell washington was 
coming out of high school, just in terms, maybe not physically, but as a pass catcher, he's further along. Um, and Darnell Washington was extremely raw. I mean, he was a slow burn at Georgia, and obviously he was a little bit of a needle mover just because of that massive frame that he had, and he could cover up people on the line of scrimmage. But, you know, Keori Armstrong, I don't think he's going to be in that 270 range like Darnell Washington, but, man, I like this kid a lot. I mean, I get excited, and then you think about the ceiling as well. I mean, he's, he's got a long way to go in a very, very positive way. Yeah, I mean, I think he's one you you take him, you figure it out him out later. And the reason why I think some of us have, have said, all right, defensive line is because is exactly what you said. I mean, at the point, uh, you know, he he embraces contact. It's not like a, all right, oversized big man that you just throw targets to out on the perimeter. Like, this is a guy that does it in the trenches. Tom, Texas A&M sitting 29th right now. Let's assume they get Hussan a few weeks, April 14th. What is that? Two and a half weeks away. Where do you think the Aggies could be entering commitment season, which is in which is in you know that June July window? I mean, is this a class that's going to challenge for a top fifteen spot? I know that's putting you on the spot because you don't have a class calculator, but what do you think the ceiling is? I think they're trending up. Um, you know, I was talking about I was talking to Noah McHale, top one hundred linebacker, um, this past weekend at, at Battle Houston, and he was there for two days. Um, actually, skipped another visit to stay with with A and M for a second day, and that was an eye opener, man. He loves Mike Elko, Jay Bateman. Um, they are they are trending up for the uh, West Coast standout. For a while, I was thinking it was just going to be USC or Oregon. So again, that's another guy that we need to pencil in as a as a potential candidate to land in this class. Um, and he'll probably make a decision sooner rather than later. So we'll see where things go from there. Um, and then another one I'm watching is DJ Sanders, a top 150 defensive lineman. A and M is probably the favorite at that point. I mean, Texas is also also battling, but that's just one that I could see Mike Elko personally recruiting, getting done. And then while we're talking A and M, just announced a commitment day for April 3rd. Defensive lineman Landon Rink, a three star. I could see A and M getting this one done. In fact, I'm going to throw a crystal ball pick in right now. Join Steve Wolfong who. Tossed a pick in for the Aggies this morning once the commitment date was announced. Andrew Hattersley over at Gigum 24-7 also throwing a pick in for AM. So again, trending in the right direction, moving the needle. Mike Elko is going to end up with a with a really strong class um, if he lands a lot of these top guys. You're making up for time, Tom, throwing in a lot of these crystal balls in one show. What is that? Number three or number four today? Three. I think it's four. three. Are Just tired of talk? dealing with the backlash from you guys. So we're gonna Don't don't let him get hot. Let's see if he can go three for three on the on the show here. Um, Washington? Washington? When's the last time we talked about Washington? It's been some time. Number 42 currently ranked uh, in terms of where they are in the 2025 class rankings. Jed Fish, understandably, has a lot of work to do. Uh, it's going to be an interesting one. Then you talk about Troy Dannon. He's out of there. He's, he's still Lincoln, Nebraska. He was there for a cup of coffee. Um New AD coming over from Wazoo, tough situation for Washington State. I mean, that would have been a huge deal a couple months ago before this realignment. Now it's just like, what do you want them to do? Uh, UW, like I said, sit number 42. Their last three finishes, 46, 26, and 95th. Um, so thinking about Washington, a lot of that comes into context. I think DeBoer's first year, his first full year, and then obviously him uh, departing for Alabama put a dent in that uh, 2024 class. Uh, a couple of the names at the top of the board, a couple of familiar ones. Uh, Zadarius Rainey Sale, top 247 linebacker, Hayden Lowe out of California. A new name, a uh, guy that I got to buzz this morning, big fan of, Raiden Vines Bright, now at IMG Academy via Arizona. Uh, Matai Tungai, I get that right, Tom? You nailed it. Um, and then Madden Ferramo, uh, top 247 linebacker as well. Arizona was one of those programs that was just kind of like, man, they're just kind of out there doing what they do. Um, and sure, they had guys like uh, Noah Fafidi and uh, Tutoria McMillan. And obviously McMillan was the big one. But I think other guys, uh, Manu at the linebacker position, they've obviously hit the portal hard. They're one of those teams on the West Coast that I don't think a lot of people really noticed. Obviously, people were taking notice of what they were doing on the field. But Drew, I was a big fan of kind of what they were starting to develop as one of the better, I think, power five, second tier, uh, I, I call them a second tier program, but in terms of what they've done from a talent identification standpoint, it's very noteworthy. 
Yeah, no, they've hit on some guys. And I thought last year we talked a ton about Arizona. And obviously, you know, um, they lost out on Elijah rushing, but they had him committed. Uh, you also had uh, DeMond Williams, who uh, they beat out plenty for, had him in the boat. Now he's following that staff to Washington. I would agree. I, I like kind of the – the game plan the off-field staff has there in terms of, okay, we're going to key on these guys. We're going to be in this, this different parts of the country. And I think with this list of five guys, you just rattled off. I mean, they're all in pockets that make sense for Washington recruit to recruit. Uh, Raiden Vines Bright, originally from Arizona, that staff was all over him there. Now he's going to be at IMG Academy. You know, his wide receiver tape is awesome. You know, I think he's one of the best when it comes to winning with his release um, and then you think about him there in that in that Huskies offense, um, Tom. I, like, do you have a feel for what they're trying? I mean, it seems like they're swinging big. I'm a fan of what they're doing, and I kind of want to run on a couple couple names that we we already mentioned, but and I, I, and we already talked about a bunch of crystal ball picks. But I got another one. Uh, top two, four, seven linebackers: Adrius Rainey, Sale. You mentioned him, Cooper. I like him to Washington. I'm going to go ahead and throw the crystal ball pick in right now. Feel like the Huskies are going to get him back in the fold. Um, he committed to Washington back in January, decommitted once Kalen DeBoer left for Alabama. Most expected him to kind of follow to the Crimson Tide and land in Tuscaloosa. But I think the Washington staff's doing such a good job. Uh, Jed Fish, Matt Doherty, a bunch of guys on staff. They're really making him priority and uh, feel good about that crystal ball pick. So when you're talking about Washington right now, that's top 247 guy. I got a couple others in the top 247. Hayden Lowe from California, I think. They're in a really good spot. They're battling Miami, Washington, and Texas, and a few others. But great visit to Miami recently. Coral Gables, that, that trip kind of shook things up a little bit. But I can absolutely see Washington get that one done. Um, another guy, Jackson Lloyd, top 150 uh, offensive lineman out of California. Again, Washington, I think, could be at the top of the board there. Alabama is kind of a dark horse. They're doing a really good job there. UCLA and Cal as well. But and I definitely don't want to sleep on DeBoer and pulling him to Alabama. But I think if he was going to pick a school today, I could see it absolutely being being Washington. So I really like what they're doing. I know a lot of people were projecting Raiden Vines Bright to end up out of state and far away from the West Coast, but and maybe landing at Notre Dame. Just visited there this week. But I think Washington could get that one done as well. I'm actually smart money, safe money, probably in state from from his hometown with Arizona, maybe Arizona State, but. Washington's definitely a contender. He's going to take an official visit there. Um, and then I think a few that people aren't talking about uh, Washington enough. Top 247 wide receiver, Philip Bell. Top 100 linebacker, Matai Tungai. Top 150 linebacker, Madden Faramo. I think all of them could absolutely pick uh, Washington in the end, um, especially Tungai and Faramo. Um, when Faramo released his top four, um, uh, Notre Dame, Ohio State, Oregon, and USC were in it. Washington was not, but they actually have had strong dialogue with him behind the scenes. So you can't rule them out there. We'll see if he gets on campus because like him and even Noah McHale, another top 100 linebacker, if those guys get to Washington, like they're kind of kicking around behind the scenes, all bets are off. So again, a lot to like with what Washington is doing right now, the recruiting efforts. We'll see if they can pay off. Very uh, Chris Peterson-esque, right? And Kalen DeBoer, was and he wasn't uh, in terms of what they try to do from a geographical standpoint. Uh, when you think about Rainy Sale, low, Vines Bright, even though he's at IMG Academy, originally from Arizona, Togiai, Faramo, California, they are all from that Pac-12 footprint, right? They are not going into areas where that W loses a little bit of its brand value. Uh, Jed Fish said he wants to have the highest ranked recruiting class in Washington football history. And I respect that. I think that that's what you should do. You should aim high. Now, the highest one was, I think, in 2019, you know, which is those two classes are, are, are netting the guys that you're getting ready to see here. Uh, you know, the 2019 and the 2020 class, when you talk about Fatanu and you talk about Adunze and you talk about Trice and you talk about all these guys, um, that's where they were from, right? Braylon Trice was from Arizona. Troy Fatanu was from Las Vegas. Roma Dunze was from Las Vegas. And you think about who they're competing against. Oregon's, you know, a national team, right? They can recruit nationally. Uh, we talked about Georgia having a very specific uh, standard for what they want in their linebacker room. You know, Oregon is a, a different category, but they can, no pun intended, they can stretch their wings a little bit longer and go coast to coast for some guys 
um, and win out a couple of those recruitments. You think about USC, from what we've seen and what we talked about, I mean, USC is pedal, pedal to the metal on a very national approach. So what about these guys? I mean, and, and you look about Rainey Sale, like, Top 150 player, Hayden Lowe, another top 247 guy. Vines Bright, we like a lot. High three-star. Tongue guy, Ferramo, both top 247 guys. It leaves this nice little niche for Jed Fish to exploit. And if you're Washington and you're Jed Fish, that's exactly what you have to do. Um, and I really like it, man. And if they can get these guys in the boat, then they are going to carve out uh, a very comfortable spot in the Big Ten by just being more efficient geographically, quite frankly. Well, they also, I'm, I'm, I'm peeping this official visitors expected list here for the summer months. Dijon Lee's expected to take an official visit. Uh, Baron Noni, the tight end. Uh, Vander Plog, another tight end. Anquan Fagans from Alabama. When's the last time Washington was in the Yellowhammer State? Well, that just, I mean, that totally undoes the point of everything that I was just saying about <laughs> them just being geographically efficient in the Anquan fee. I don't know. Maybe he's up there for seven on seven. Who knows? Sometimes those those piggyback. But you get my point uh, on Washington. Any any final thoughts on, on Jed Fish and UW? 15th, I think 15th place finish is going to be hard in, in, in his first full class. 100%. Um, and, you know, UW should be – year in and year out a top 25 program uh when it comes to recruiting uh at bare minimum and i would say the ceiling for a washington program and what i mean by that when it comes to recruiting is like everything is in place uh from you know a player development standpoint from a win-loss record uh to continuity in the coaching staff uh and continuity with the message i think it's like 12. You know, that's that's kind of the way that I view if if you got to there, uh, then you're really cooking with gas. So uh, UW going to be a team to watch, as Tom Loy has alluded to. A&M Texas uh, also seem to be gearing up as well. <sighs> 